Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to see all of you, so many old friends here. Uh, my name is Marie Arana. I, am, I have the great privilege of being a senior consultant to the uh, Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, and I'm also a writer and uh, formerly the um, editor-in-chief of Book World at the Washington Post for many years, and uh, uh, also a veteran of the publishing world. I worked for Harcourt Brace as a senior editor and vice president for many years, and then went on to work at Simon & Schuster as well. So I've been around the block, a bit of a, a veteran in all fields. But uh, we've learned so many things in this conference so far, and it's just such, such a delight, such a pleasure to have heard um, uh, Ismail Sarageldin's wonderful keynote speech about the importance of words and uh, the report from the front lines of so many countries, South Africa and uh, Russia, uh, marvelous. And to learn that um, the first encounter between uh, Europe and the New World, between the conquistadors and the Inca, was over a book. And uh, that, uh, on and on with the, the heritage of Thomas Jefferson and and the wonderful uh, discussions about copyright that we just heard. Uh, such a, a vibrant discussion, and so wonderful to know that it will go on in these summits as we go forward around the world. Now, what we have learned in the whole process is that the book culture is changing, although uh, we all know, I think in our hearts, that books will survive. The world of books which we have known for so long, and to which we've dedicated our lives, will shift, uh, as it did and has done, from scrolls to books, from monks to people, and from leather-bound tomes to pocketbooks. Uh, I've just finished writing a book on Simon Bolivar, which will come out next year. And you know, Bolivar would take a printing press onto the battlefield and he would carry it uh, along with the cannon and the muskets and the horses and the cattle. Uh, he, there was the printing press and the, the Spanish would laugh at him. You know, why was he lumbering uh, through the uh, jungle and the Andes and with the printing press? And he, in the course of, of uh, liberating six countries, changed the language because he began to write in a kind of Spanish that was very different that was very vibrant, that was not the dusty old Castilian that, uh, that was spoken or written in before. And somebody asked me just the other day, well, what, I bet if um, Bolivar were living today, um, he would have been using social media. And I'm sure he would have. Would he have changed the language? I don't know. And of course, that's, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, which will bring us to the subject of the making of books, which is, you know, the Bible tells us there is no end to the making of books. So we're very lucky, very fortunate to have a great panel of speakers. We're still waiting for the fourth one to come, and I hope she will come descending on us like um, uh, an angel from on high. But uh, we have uh, two representatives of fiction. I wanted to make sure that we had two representatives of fiction from different, and nonfiction from different houses. Um, it, it, and I chose Nantalise and Jeff Klosky as uh, I, I invited them because I thought they were two very different uh, corners of the industry. And it turns out that just, I think it was 10 days ago, a week ago, um, Penguin and Random House have merged, making probably the largest um, trade publishing conglomerate in the world. So uh, although I thought I was inviting people from, from two corners of the world, they, are, they have become one corner of the world, uh, even as we've um, gathered together here. Uh, we also are very fortunate to have Karen Lotz of Candlewick and Walker a uh, company that has consistently been one of the most innovative children's publishers around, and Nico Fund, who represents the, must, the, the very revered scholarly publisher, Oxford University Press. 
Before I introduce each of them separately, I want to say a few words about publishing in general and a few uh, cameos of the notable events of the past year uh, just to set the stage. And let me start with the events of the past year. First, after 244 years, the Encyclopedia Britannica announced in January of this year that it is stopping its presses, ceasing its print publication, and going 100% digital. The Britannica's last print version is a 32 volume, 130 pound, 2010 edition. That's one cameo. Another highlight from the year, number two. In June, Folger Library announced that for the first time in history, all of its Shakespeare Library editions will be available in ebook format. For less than the price of a mass market paperback, each of the Bard's works is now downloadable, electronically readable, and printable on demand. Cameo number three. Publishers Weekly which is the official magazine of the publishing trade, announced its choice for Publishing Person of the Year. Not Hilary Mantel, who was the first woman to win the Booker Prize twice, and not anything like the Publishing People of the Year in years past, uh, David Shanks, for instance, who was the CEO of Penguin, who, who really managed to balance nicely the um, digital and print publications of his company. He was the choice last year. And not the choice before, which was uh, anyone like the choice before, who was the Barnes & Noble head, Len Riggio, who managed to diversify his company at a very critical time um, and not going under as Borders did. And he, was not, he was the choice in 2010, this year. The choice was E.L. James, not P.D. James, E.L. James, the soft porn author of Fifty Shades of Grey. This is the publishing person of the year. The rationale, because, and I quote, her erotic trilogy connects with people who are not regular readers. <laughs> so this is progress, folks. <laughs> Now to the industry in general. I mean, we really have had dramatic, dramatic changes. Um, I'm just going to talk about the, the, just very briefly about the last five years. Um, the United States, as we know, is the largest producer of books in the world. And in the course of the last decade, we've seen that production burgeon. When I began editing Book World at the Washington Post in the 90s, American publishers were producing 50,000 books a year. Ten years later, I was still in the same position in 2003, they were producing 330,000 books annually. Book World, at the time, we were getting 100, 150 books a day, 40,000 books a year, and of that 40,000, only 1,600 would be reviewed. In 2007, that number climbed to 415,000 books a year, published by American publishers. In 2009, a mere two years later, 1,100,000 books were published in the USA, according to Bowker. Two-thirds of them, or 725,000 of them, were self-published. So you see the, um, the whole idea of self-publishing, the social media, the, put my, the, the Facebook culture, um, brought about a huge wave of self-publishing. In 2011, just last year, Bauke reported three million books published in this country. I suspect only about 15 or 20 percent of those were published by mainstream university or small presses. This means that readers are faced with exponentially more and more books. But it also means less and less of a market for each title. The average book in America, believe it or not, sells 250 copies, copies a year. Average, when you average the millions that, um, that Stephen King might sell. 
and you know the one that you might sell. 